uh, last time. So we talked about Duke's theorem. Duke, at least in the case of, uh, so if we, as, as the discriminant goes to plus infinity, although we also talked about minus infinity and Higner points, uh, if you sum over the closed geodesics having that discriminant and average, of course, one over the class number, and then integrate over the closed geodesic uh, your favorite nice function, like the indicator function of a region, normalized by the length of the geodesic. By the way, they'll all have the same length. Never mind, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, and this is with respect to arc length, so ds. This converges as d goes to infinity to the integral of f over the full g mod gamma or h mod gamma, one over the volume of g mod gamma. Okay, so this was uh, the closed geodesics in together, and maybe not individual ones, but together filling out space with the density dx dy over y squared. And in fact, what I've written here is with the unit tangent bundle. So even the uh, even the unit tangent vectors equidistribute. So uh, anyway, that's that was the theorem. So ELMV, ELMV. This is Einsiedler. Uh, uh, Lyndon Strauss. See my scene away from the book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Michelle, Philippe Michelle, and Akshay Venkatesh. We're trying to understand this theorem from the point of view of ergodic theory. Now, Linick had already proved, and I should say Linick. And then dashes mean that they work together? Yes, so all four of these. Uh, yeah, I don't know how consistent I am about that, but yes, this is a. a so they wrote a series of papers. They were trying to understand this in higher rank. They, they proved some, uh, some analog of this in uh, GL3, but they also went back to try to understand this in, uh, in Duke's setting, which is where Linux really uh, had some... some uh, okay, let me not go into how Linux did this, because I, I want to get somewhere today, unlike most days where I start somewhere and take, take forever yes. and, and why, uh, don't finish. Um, so usually... Uh... Why, why, why do you usually say GL instead of SL for the higher rank version? Um, there is a, it's, it's basically the same thing because the GL you mod out, it, it's easier to write instead of in SL, the, the difference between writing um, one Y zero zero and writing root Y zero zero one over root Y is not so significant. But then when you go to higher rank and you have a whole bunch of Ys, and now you have to keep track of the fact that they all need to be, uh, their product needs to be one, gets the formulas get like this, get really ugly. Yeah, and it's more helping, convenient. Of helping, it like hurts. Yes, it's more convenient to uh, write it like this. Yeah. Um, but it's, when you have GL, you still mod out by the center. <laughs> so you may as well work in SL. It's just that it's just more convenient. Um, so, so they asked the following question, could it be a, as sort of a, a contra distinction to this? Okay, so I should give you a little bit more information, which is that um, what people, so they were working on this, they were working on this, on this problem. And what people had uh, shown, uh, of course, okay, let me remark, make, make a few remarks. So this isn't what they were, they were doing. Remark, as you move through the class number one, uh, discriminants. So we don't know that there are infinitely many. So if there exists infinitely many uh, Ds with H of D equals one, if there's, if the class number is one infinitely often, that's telling you that those curves are individually becoming space filling. Right. Those curves individually, individually space fill. I exhibit a sequence of them that... Uh... Right. But what people uh, conjectured, so people believe, let me say it like this, people believe that as long as you move through discriminants, as long as your limit is along discriminants with the class number less than the maximal one, by a power, okay. As long as you with, with this for for some for some fixed 
epsilon, then every individual geodesic equidistributes, then every individual, individual. So, so this shouldn't be something about class number one. This should be something about non-maximal class number. Remember the largest class number is root D. Wait, and then in, in the paper that you shown for the thin orbits, um, was that uh, maximal? The 13, 38, or I don't know. Yes. Yes. So, so the largest ones, uh, recall the, the largest ones happen when the root, when the um, fundamental solution to the Pell equation is the smallest, which happens. Uh, so, HD is of size D to the half, roughly, let's say plus little o1, when uh, D is the four less than a square. Right, and you did that to generate that example. To generate that example. Because in that example, the pictures would then line up to look like something uh, filling, but individually they did. So That's right. What you're saying is that if you found something non-maximal, just a little smaller. Yes. Is if you went to class numbers that were less than the maximal ones, as you move through those, pick one geodesic out of each that will still equidistribute then every individual geodesic still equidistributes. It's crazy. Okay, so, so if you want to find some non-equidistributing behavior, you have to go to these largest possible uh, class numbers. So what they asked is, are there some other limits? So ELMV asked, ELMV. Don't take the average. Don't take the average. Take any one of each class instead of averaging the whole class. Okay. And they'll still become. Still make D grow to infinity. And still make D to grow to infinity. Yes. Okay, so. As large as one half minus epsilon, but D to the epsilon, as long as the class number is not one. But as long as the class number is at most d to the epsilon for some small epsilon, people have shown this individual equidistribution. It's kind of crazy. And on the Riemann hypothesis for certain rankin selberg elk functions, you can do this up to d to the quarter minus epsilon. Wait, so, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, but they were trying to understand, you know, can there be other limits? Can there be other limits? So in a sense, only the maximal piece is special. The rest of them are uh, the the rest of them are expected to be generic, con converging to harm measure. So this is like a unique ergodicity uh, type question. Can there be other limits? For example, can the support be compact? The limiting support be compact. What does it mean to be compact? Well, you have this fundamental domain, which is non-compact because it goes up to infinity. Does there exist some height? So does there exist some A, some height A, such that infinitely many, infinitely many uh, closed geodesics, closed geodesics are below, lie below, lie in, let's say, lie in ya which is the set of uh ya is the set of z in our favorite fundamental domain intersect the imaginary part of z is less than it. okay now this statement is also trivial it's mm -hmm. also uh, this question is also trivial to answer in the affirmative why so this is easy easy to do why? What does it mean to go high? How, how can a geodesic go high? How can a geodesic go high? Well, if you remember, uh, especially a closed geodesic, we can always make some alpha greater than one and an alpha bar between zero and negative one. And then the continued fraction expansion of this, if this is exactly periodic, the continued fraction expansion is exactly the number of 
uh, is exactly captured by this sequence of L's and R's uh, in your fairy sequence. So this is L, L, and so on, and R, 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 whatever. So how right? low you can go would then tell you how high you can end up. Right? So in order to go high, how does a geodesic go up high? In order to go high, so to go high, what you need is a whole bunch of how do I how do I get high in the fundamental domain? I need to go up and up and up and up and up. In other words, I need to go over and 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 over before I come back down. In other words, I need to have an L and L and L and L and L and L a long sequence of L's. You need a big digit. So to go high, need a big partial quotient. Partial quotient. Well, so it's very simple to make low-lying closed geodesic. So a geodesic uh, equ a equivalent, um, there's an equivalence between low-lying, low-lying closed geodesics and our favorite uh, semi-group, gamma A, <laughs> which is generated by, which is these, these numbers less than A, Where there's where there's a correspondence between this number a and uh, low lying meaning in y a a prime. Um, I guess I have another like uh, strange motivation question. Was there any reason like beforehand other than this is like an easy question to ask? Well, why it would be of importance to ask these sort of questions like oh how many geodesics am I going to have fitting like uh, like why? Did people just explore this because it was easy to explore or? Well, they needed to understand, you know, uh, what other possible limits are, uh, could be. And one natural thing to ask is, could the, could the limit be compact? In other words, if all the geodesics, if all the geodesics you're producing here are, are lying below A, you're not going to get any support. Whatever the limiting measure is, it's going to have no support up here. So it's not going to be harm measure. You're sort of exploring measures. Positive. Exactly. Possible limiting measures. So, um, so of course, what's, what's trivial about this is uh, you cook up any, any sequence with small partial quotients that gets you a closed geodesic that doesn't go high. Um, but the real, and remember, you can make class number one. Yeah, so... Uh, if there exists fundamental, uh, infinitely many uh, geodesics, th this is easy if you don't force fundamentality. So the question that we don't know is, are there infinitely many fundamental geodesics, it's fundamental it's discriminants? Uh, Lagrange, was it? Dirichlet. Dirichlet already uh, yes. exhibited a five times something. Exactly, uh, exactly. So, so the real question became, can you make these closed geodesics that are low lying. So, so the real question, ELMV, uh, can one create an infinite sequence of low lying, closed low lying, and fundamental closed geodesics? Fundamental. And fundamental is just based on discriminants, right? Exactly. So a closed geodesic has a discriminant because it has a binary quadratic form. That discriminant can be fundamental or not. And let me remind you, fundamental, uh, so D is fundamental. If it's one mod four, basically, uh, it, it means that D is square free. Okay. If you're one mod, and then otherwise it's... If, it's, if you're zero mod four, then you have to divide it by four, then you have to be two or three mod four. When you divide out by four, and that has to be square. Wait, why? Uh, I, I forgot again. Why? Why was this uh, definition for fundamentality? Because that is the discriminant of a real quadratic field. So there's a general notion uh, okay, okay. Uh, in algebraic number theory of the discriminant of field, and uh, it wasn't that it was a, it was wasn't an arbitrary choice. It's not an arbitrary <laughs> choice. So for one thing, um, if your discriminant is fundamental, then every uh, quadratic form with that discriminant is necessarily primitive. So if your discriminant is, uh, I don't know if I'm going to come up with one off the top of my head, a eight, eight is divisible by four. No, that's okay. Uh, if your discriminant is, I don't know, 40, and it should be 20. Anyway, uh, 
if if you write down uh if you can if you have a, a quadratic form that's imprimitive its discriminant is certainly not fundamental right so you have that direction right okay um, the other question i had i guess was this digits question getting a bunch of l's or was that like equivalent with uh right the solution to this problem um like you're saying like oh if you get a bunch of l's then you're going high but is there some other way to go high Does no because the only way to go high what does it mean to go high how can you go high? Because it's if you a, got an R, it means you did an inversion. Is what well, a whole or a whole bunch of R's. You know, there's no uh, there's no natural starting place. There's no forced starting place here. So you might it, it might be it's not necessarily the first digit that's that's large. It could be some future digit that's large. And when it you know if you have if you only had two L's and then an R and then an R and then thirty L's down here. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that another cop, uh, there's another version, like it doesn't look like it's high because you haven't put it back in the fundamental domain. Yeah. But an equivalent, when you cycle it around so that these cycle to the, to the end and these cycle to the front. Okay, but then, that, so what you're saying is if you have a badly approximal number, then your geodesic has to be low. Exactly. Is, That's exactly right. I guess I, I'm not seeing that exactly. But, but, that's, but that's what this, it, how can you go high? You can only go high by going across. The way to get up here along a geodesic trajectory, yeah. if this is your top point, this is your highest point. Well, that means that the geodesic trajectory from there is horizontal, which means that there's a circle that your geodesic followed, which means your geodesic crossed a whole bunch of horizontal lines oh, along its I way. See, I see. Because you literally mean highest, highest. Yes. Yeah, because what I was thinking was what happens if uh, you know you invert it and then it like shot you up like really high. Okay, but that's a fraction. That's a rational number. That's not a closed geodesic. The only way to go straight up. Well, I didn't mean like straight up. I mean like at a very like yeah, that's level. exactly what's happening here. Exactly what's happening here yeah, is that you're yeah. shooting straight up. But if you manage to get any any uh, height. The only way to do it is to do it horizontally because the geodesics are, are semicircles. Okay, I this point. Yeah. Thanks. So that became the problem. Can you make out of these uh, low lying closed geodesics, can you make ones where the discriminant is square free? Now, let me argue for you that this is easy to solve and then see if you can find the mistake. Okay. So claim that this is easy to solve with some black boxes, easy to solve. It, it at least looks, this looks easy to solve. Okay, so, um, so why is that? Um, sorry, let me just pin this in case. There we go. Okay. Um, why does this look easy to solve? Um, right. So we want to make, so we'll, we'll move through, uh, we will move through those Ds that are four less than a square. Okay. And, um, and we'll look at uh, the gamma A. So if you have a matrix M in gamma A, then it's automatically it automatically corresponds to a closed geodesic. And what is its trace? Well, it's trace squared minus four, trace of m squared minus four, is the discriminant times a square. Do you remember this? We talked about this last time that the uh, the square free part of trace squared minus four is the field over which m is defined. And in fact, when you have your equation, whatever m fixes. Um, Whatever m fixes, m alpha equals alpha. Alpha is equal to something plus root trace squared minus four. And you might have to divide top and bottom by some s to get to the actual discriminant. So it's the discriminant times a square. But if I can make this already square free, then there is no square. And that really is the, the discriminant. So let me just make that a, a observation. Observation is if trace m squared minus four is square free, then 
the geodesic corresponding to M is already fundamental. Exactly, exactly. The only way that this can uh, be, yeah, it's, it's clear, right? It's not a necessary condition, but it's a sufficient condition. Okay, um, so all you have to do is go to this semigroup and sieve down to square free values of trace squared minus four. Now, this should look easy. So let me explain to you why this should look easy. Um, right, so we need, we need some black boxes. So one black box is a sieve. Uh, sieves allow, allow one to understand uh, things about square freeness or almost primes, almost primes from um, understanding something about the distribution in progressions of your sequence from distribution in progressions of your sequence. So let me make this uh, more precise. So here's the, the uh, sieve black box, sieve black box in this particular case, although you'll see in a second that it's much more general. So if we want, if we know, suppose we know the following, suppose we know the following. Um, when I look at my matrices in a ball of size, whatever, N, uh, is it, I, I go back bit and forth between gamma being closed geodesics or gamma being matrices. Uh, it's okay if I leave this as a gamma instead of writing it as an M. You don't care. There's a correspondence, yeah, but now I mean matrices, so I can say trace, whatever. Um, so if you look at those geodesics, those matrices with trace squared minus four, trace of the geodesic square minus four, congruent to zero mod Q. We have a prime factor for wait, is Q, what is Q in this case? So Q is a parameter and N is a parameter. Suppose I have an expression like this. Suppose I can prove this, this fact that as I sum over gamma and gamma in a ball, and I collect only those that are that for which the trace squared minus four is divisible by Q. Well, how often should that happen? Roughly speaking, what fraction of the time should trace squared minus four be zero mod Q? Let's say Q is prime, just to make things simple. Well, if Q is prime, the only way trace squared is four is if the trace is two or negative two. So you have two possible traces mod Q. So there's a fraction, there's, yeah. And, and this is a black box with a lot of lying, by the way. So <laughs> suppose that you can show that this is like two over Q on average times the actual number of, of, the, uh, of the elements, of the points in there, with an error that depends on Q and N. Okay, well, there's nothing to prove. Uh, Q, this error is defined by this difference. And, Suppose that you can show that the average value of this error, if you sum these errors with Q going up to some parameter Q, big Q, that this average sum, let me again lie and be crude, is little O of the total number of elements in the ball. Okay. With, and let's say you can show this with Q as large as some power of N. Let's just call it N to the alpha. Uh, like by saying something more than the total or is it like this is weaker than what's needed? Okay. You need not just little o, you need like some uh, lots of powers of log. In practice, we'll we'll save a power. Yeah. But okay. So I'm being I'm being crude in lots of places. This isn't really two over q and so on. It's something that's two over q on average. <laughs> over okay. over primes. Okay. okay. Um, so if you can produce, so this is, by the way, this two is called the sieve dimension. If you hear these words, now you know what they. Yeah, other than Tartosthenes, obvious sieve. Uh, we go to this nice square, square and I guess the idea. Um, yeah, because it's, it's how many values mod Q uh, you expect to see. Okay. Okay, so yeah, you're right. If this was an nth degree polynomial, this will typically, the sieve dimension will typically be n something like this. 
And this alpha, this n, this q, the largest q for which this still holds is called the level of distribution. This is called the level of distribution. And I'm lying a little bit, uh, but it's OK. This alpha is called the exponent of distribution. And which of these parameters affects the logs that you have? Um, forget I said anything about logs. That'll take us too far. OK, so suppose there exists an alpha positive such that we have EQ defined by this difference and the sum of the EQ going all the way up to a power uh, is still smaller than the total number of points. Then this is the sieve black box. Then what you can show is that the number, the number of gamma in gamma a intersect bn, for which this trace squared minus four is almost prime. With the, so let me say that in the following way. If a prime divides trace squared minus four, this is trace of gamma minus four, trace of gamma squared minus four. If a prime divides this thing, then that prime has to be large, at least n to the big one. So then there exists a beta so that the number of points here is at least, I'll explain why, why this, why I'm calling this almost prime, is at least the total number of points divided by log to the sieve div dimension, log squared n. Okay, let's parse all of this. Okay. Yeah, you don't have a lot of prime dividing, right? Because if every prime is greater than n, the beta then at least some smaller. Perfect. Okay. And you said this bigger, bigger than the volume. Okay, so so for let me let me just write exactly what you just said. So if the prime divides this number, this number is of size n squared. So this means that this implies that trace squared uh, gamma minus four can't have more than more than uh, two over beta prime factors. Uh, Otherwise, it would be yeah. Every prime factor is at least this size. Okay, so this is what's called an almost prime, a number that has a bounded number of prime factors. Okay, and then the lower bound here is well, it's the total number, except we lose a factor of log. And we lose a factor of log for every uh, time that there's a there's a solution to this modular equation. So that's why this sieve dimension, it's like the twin primes problem. In fact, maybe I'll do the twin primes. Uh, maybe I'll do Brun's Brun's sieve uh, for or the Selberg upper bound sieve would be an even better thing to do. Just, just, I'll give you some feel of how this implication goes. Yeah, well, okay. I've never seen any sieve stuff. Okay, so this is a sieve black box. Sieve black box. If we know the distribution of numbers in progressions and can get something like this, then we can produce almost prime values of whatever quantity it is that we're trying to measure, and lots of them. And then you're saying all but log squared. Cardinality of gamma a uh, cap bn is. Yeah, this we know from our previous. Uh, uh, let me remind you here: the cardinality of gamma a in a ball of size n is n to the two delta. Delta right. A is that uh, Hausdorff dimension. dimension. And so you have a power over. Exactly. Over You're losing logs, logs which you don't care about. Okay. okay. So in terms of powers, it's uh, one to the, this is this thing to the one minus little o one. You haven't lost the power. Right. You've lost less than a power by, by adding this restriction. Okay. So far, so good. We have this sieve black box. And you're saying, do the line come from the black boxes or from something you're doing outside of the black box? Oh, the line's all over the place. Uh, um, <laughs> so this is pretty close to the truth. There's there's some there's some small lies, like this little low isn't really a little low, this two isn't really a two, but and in so principle, on. principle, things like this can be done. Yes, exactly. exactly. And this is a standard uh, method. method and argument. Let me give you another black box which is needed, okay? I'm trying to argue that this is, uh, that producing square free values is heuristically is easy, okay? <laughs> Here's our second black box, which is expansion. Black box, box, expansion. And I made reference to this a little bit 
when we were talking about Zaremba. But here's the black box. It says that um, if you look at which matrices in gamma A in a ball of size N are congruent, so you fix your favorite matrix gamma zero in SL2 Z mod QZ. And you wanna say which, what's the uh, probability that what's the fraction of the matrices in a ball of size N that are lie in a prescribed residue class? Is it gonna be like what we expect? It's gonna be like what we expect, yeah. So it's the total number, it's the total number times uh, the, the proportion, the proportionality, one over the size of SL2Q. In other words, uh, no one matrix, no one residue class should be more, should be preferred over another. Plus an error, which is um, which is of size, let's call it like this, number of elements in gamma in a ball divided by some power, okay? Theta so there exists a theta positive. So the, the existence of the theta comes before, uh, let's put it like this. There exists a theta positive such that for all, for all Q and for all gamma naught on Q, we have this, okay? So that we can count things. And now this is only um, an, uh, only non-trivial. This is only non-trivial if, how many elements are there in SL2Q, roughly? Q cubed or something? Q cubed, exactly, Q yeah, cubed. Yeah. Yeah, right, because it's AD minus BC equals one. That's one modular condition. Uh, so once you know A and D, then and B, then C is determined. Something like that. Um, right. So there, there are n squared points in SL two Z, but uh, in Z mod Q Z, there's Q cubed points because you don't see the distinction between a quadratic relation and a the linear one. Anyway, this is an, an easy exercise. So if we're dividing by Q cubed, when does that get swamped by this error term? Non-trivial only if... Do you want this to be big enough? Well, I want there to be a main term. Otherwise, all I have is an error. I, 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 I don't understand. I think, okay, so say I divide by the number of gamma A intersection B and then I have that the average is equal to the same. Yes. Plus something that does go to zero. Yes, but this also goes to zero. Because this is one over Q cubed. We're, I don't think we're thinking of Q as fixed. Is there, well, right? Both Q and N are allowed to grow. I want to, I want to have a uniform statement independent of Q. The statement becomes trivial if Q cubed, uh, if Q cubed is bigger than, so uh, the, it's only non-trivial if Q cubed is less than N to the theta. If the amount that you divide by here in the main term, it's not an error. it doesn't get swamped, it doesn't get sucked into the error term. Uh, sorry, Lewis, you said something? No, I was just saying um, what you said, that we're thinking of Q as large, not as fixed, right? Exactly. Q is allowed to grow with N to a, to a limit. I mean, it's allowed to go past that, but then I don't have any information. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So with these two black boxes, with the black box of uh, expansion and sieving, so here's a black box, I put a box around it, there I go, that's a box. I claim that if you have those two things, then the problem looks easy. How do you finish off the problem? Okay, so that's what we're going to do right now. So let's finish off the problem. First of all, uh, let's let's uh, establish this that needs to be established in order to use the sieve black box. Well, and I guess another question: the bottom thing, how much lying is there going on with this this black box? Or? A lot. A lot. Okay. Yes. Even in principle. Uh, in a variety of ways, yeah. The uh, first of all, gamma a, depending on your alphabet, doesn't even need to be onto SL two mod q. So this only should be for those uh, residue classes that are actually represented. Otherwise, the, the count is zero. Uh, you can get a power savings, but it's a lot more work, and uh, we didn't actually have a power savings at the time that we did this work, and so we we may do without a power savings with something weaker. Uh, but the argument will be much. Uh, 
nicer if we assume that this is what we have, which is anyway what we do now. Okay, so um, so I need to be able to analyze this in order to get this, and from this we'll get we'll get the the last thing. We want. So let's look at this. Um, how do I so how do I study the number of gamma in gamma a in a ball with trace squared minus four being zero mod q? So I, th I think Andre is hoping that we're going to catch you, right? Because you said it looks easy, but there's a catch. There right. is a catch. So, but I think, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but Andre, you, you wanted to make sure the catch wasn't in one of the black boxes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In case it was, uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there might be catches in the black boxes, but you're saying. There you're is anything, Alec? You're, you're, you guys are too good. Uh, <laughs> there is something I've already suppressed in one of the black boxes, which will come back and bite us. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about the sieve dimension. Say it again. About the sieve dimension? No, that's OK. OK. All right. It's a slight lie, but it's not the one that's going to kill us. <laughs> OK. All right. We can keep going. OK. You guys are too good. <laughs> All right. So we want to understand when this happens. We, we have a Q. We want to be able to get an estimate for this expression. OK. Well, what should we do? Break this into. Uh, uh, dyadic is also a good uh, guess. Break it into progressions, mod Q. Let's sum over gamma zero in SL2Q and then sum over gamma in gamma A in a ball, but just those that are, zero, that are congruent to gamma zero mod Q. Let's catch the, let's separate out this residue condition. Wait, so if they're in the same class? in SL2Q, then what happens? Is then the trace the squared, same? then their traces are the same mod Q. So their trace squared minus fours are the same mod Q. Uh, so this uh, condition uh, moves over to here. And now I have no condition. Oh, here. okay, okay. So that's why we're doing it progression. Exactly. In SL2Q. Exactly. So all I'm doing is separating it out like this. Okay, but what do we know about this? It doesn't depend on gamma naught. It doesn't depend on gamma naught. We have we have expansion. Okay, so we stick in expansion. So let me put this all over here. Are you calling expansion just because exactly what we did, or is there something? Uh, because it's the it's the property of this graph being an expander. Um, let let me not go into uh, that at all. But you can think of it like Dirichlet's theorem or something. Right, it's saying that like they equidistribute in residue classes. Exactly, exactly. It's a it's a kind of equidistribution, which is exactly what expander graphs are are trying to. Uh, expander graphs and what theorem? That's right. Oh, okay. That's right. That that plays a significant role in in what's going on here. Okay, so uh, the indicator function of trace gamma naught squared minus four being zero mod q, and then I'm going to substitute in what we know from uh, expansion. So I'm using expansion now. Expansion black box tells us that this sum is one over the size of SL2Q times however many things there were, gamma A in a ball, plus an error, which was gamma A in a ball times N to the minus theta. Right? We have this power savings. Okay. Um, so, how many? Okay, so here's another exercise. I'll put it here. Uh, how many matrices are there in uh, SL2Q such that the trace uh, squared gamma minus four is zero mod Q? So this, this is, these are two exercises for you guys to work out if you so choose. And I claim there's rough, there's on the order of Q squared of them. And in fact, that order is really two times Q squared. Whoa. We're back. Yep. Okay. I think that only happened locally here, and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think we're still online. Okay. So this ratio, the number of points here is Q squared. The ratio, the proportion, is our two over Q mm -hmm. times the number of gamma in a ball. And we see no swapping on the. Um, well, on we'll the we're going to see. We're going to see. Uh, the error term. So our error term is still this gamma A, 
gamma A in a ball of size N, we have this power savings into the minus theta. And there's an extra factor of how many error terms we have. There's the same end to them. This is the same as it was, but how many terms were here, roughly? Q squared. Q squared, exactly. Q squared. So this is our bound for EQN. EQN is bounded by the total number of things, n to the minus theta, Q squared. And how flexible are, is Q in terms of n? That's what we're about to find out. So we need to know that we can sum these errors up to the level, big Q, and still be under the total count. Can we do that with Q as large as a power? Okay, so let's, let's see. So if I take a sum over Q up to big Q of these EQNs, what do I get? So I'll plug in this bound for the EQNs. I have the total number of things, gamma A in a ball. I have my savings, n to the minus theta. And then I sum, I'm summing Q squared up to big Q. So that's big Q cubed. And I want, and I want, this to be little o of how, how many points there were, gamma a in a ball. Well, that's perfect. Yeah, I need q cubed to be less than n to the theta. In other words, if, if I take q to be n to the alpha, if alpha is anything less than theta over three, then I have a power savings. Right? Then I have a power savings here. If, if this exponent is theta is uh, n to the, if q is n to the theta over three, then when I cube it, I get n to the theta, and then I. The theta can be chosen in the form of gamma zero. Like we go. <laughs> Very good. The theta can be chosen uniformly in gamma zero. Yes, there exists a theta. So that for all q and for all gamma zero, we have this power c. Yes, the theta does not depend on q. That is crucial, and that is exactly what expansion tells us. Exactly. Yeah. Then you have a different one for every Q and you can't sum them uniformly. Absolutely. Okay. So we have a, but this number, whatever it is, is positive. We have a positive exponent of distribution. We have a positive exponent of distribution. So we have a black box sieve. Okay. So our sieve black box by our sieve uh, black box implies that there exists some beta so that when we, we so that we've produced these almost, almost prime values, lots of almost prime values uh, in this ball. So that the number of matrices gamma and gamma A in a ball with this property that if, you, if a prime divides the trace squared minus four of gamma, then that prime is large. The number of these guys is large, it is the number of elements in the ball with a loss that's insignificant. Okay. It's, yeah, it's less than a power loss. Okay. So let's go from there to trying to produce square free values of trace squared minus square. So what we really want. What we really want is how many gamma are in gamma A in a ball so that the uh, trace squared minus four of gamma is square free. We need this to go infinity? Yes, we just, at the moment, all we want is to, for it to go to infinity. Although in the paper, we go into some discussion about how this is uh, optimal. There, there's some, there's, there's not just a qualitative going to infinity, but it goes to infinity as fast as it possibly could. Roughly. Okay. So there's some discussion of that in the paper that I'll. Uh, and so if this were true, you're saying if this goes to infinity, then that would give us the. Uh, that will, the, the, every time we have a square free value in here, this is low lying and this is fundamental. Okay. So it would solve Dirichlet's problem. Uh, it would solve the ELMV problem. Yeah. Which is a generalization of what. 
Uh, Dirichlet, he did it for non-fundamental, and then you're saying... No, no, no. The, the Dirichlet about the class number being one was just a, uh, a reminder that non-fundamental discriminants make life a lot easier. You don't have, if you don't... Oh, the yeah, reason yeah. they wanted fundamental discriminants... I'm mixing uh, stuff up. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we just want to know, can you do this along fundamental discriminants, for example? At all. At all, yeah. Oh, and then you said that in the other case, when it's not it, fundamental, it's easy. It's trivial. Yep. It's, it's just every element of gamma A. Yeah. Exactly. So real quick, when you say uh, this paper, are you still talking about ELMB or no? Uh, no, I'm talking about the paper with Pergan that solves the ELMB problem. OK. I'll put a link to it. OK, thanks. Um, so what I will do is lower bound this by just the, get the set of gammas in this set S. Let's call this set S. The set S for which uh, trace squared minus four is square feet. Square. Okay, so I'll drop a, a whole lot. I'll drop uh, all but uh, this one over log log squared n of the elements that I could possibly have, and I restrict myself just to those elements for which uh, trace squared minus four is almost prime. Now I know that I I have a lot of these, yeah, just so I'm not I'm not losing. Yeah, I mean. The, the total number of points here is a uh, number of gamma intersect the ball. So I have, I've thrown away 100% of them. The number that I'm producing here is only one over log, zero proportion, right? One over log squared, still zero. But it's, but it's still a, a significant, I've lost less than a power. Okay. And you're sipping through them, right? So uh, you're trying to get rid of the stuff that won't. That's right. Well, this is the number of elements in S, which we know, a lower bound for minus the number of elements in S for which trace squared minus four, trace squared minus four is not squared. You agree with that? Yes, we agree with that. Okay, take all the elements of S, the square free ones are the ones that I, when I subtract off the ones that are not square. Now, what does it mean to be not square free? If trace squared minus four is not square free, then there exists a prime, in fact, the square of a prime that divides trace squared gamma minus four. Now, uh, trace squared gamma minus four is uh, trace uh, plus two times trace minus two. But the only thing this could have in common is four. The, the prime is large. The, the prime, uh, any such prime, because we're in S, any prime dividing this is at least n to the beta. Okay, and these two numbers differ by four. So actually, uh, p squared either divides trace plus two or trace minus two. Yeah, because if you divide both, then it divides four, then yes. Think so. yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay, and this number is of size n. So that means that p is at most uh, size root n. Okay, so I want an upper bound. I want to estimate how many elements there are. I got a little lost. Yes. <laughs> so you're saying, what was it about P dividing four? So if it's not square free, then there's some square of a prime that divides trace squared minus four. Yeah. But this thing factors as trace plus two times trace minus two. Yeah. Well, P divides a product of two things. P squared divides a product of two things. Right. I claim that that means that P squared divides only one of them. If P divides trace, plus two and P divides trace minus two. Yeah. Well, the difference between trace plus two and trace minus two is four. Oh, so P divides GCD, four. GCD is bounded by four. Okay, I see. But, but the prime is huge. Okay. okay. So it must divide one or the other, which in particular means that it has size, since this is of size N, P squared has to divide something of size N. So P has to be at most of size root N. Traces of size n. The matrix is of size n. This okay. s is of size n. Okay. okay. So let's see if we can estimate how many guys are uh, trace squared minus four are not square free. Well, so there has to be such a prime. So we'll let sum over the primes that are of size at least n to the beta, at most n to the half. Okay. Let's sum over the t's 
uh, so that uh, trace t squared minus four, so the t is less than n, less than n, so that t squared minus four is zero mod p, mod p squared. And then let's sum over uh, the matrices gamma and gamma a uh, in a ball of size n so that the trace of gamma is equal to t. Is there an error in that sense? Well, that's, I'm, I'm upper bounding this contribution. So anything that contributes to this has a prime in this range with that prime dividing uh, t squared minus four. So, so I'm just turning, I'm just uh, interchanging the order of summations. Okay, so if we start with a prime of this order, we can find, we can look at all possible t's of size n, but those t's have to be uh, plus or minus two mod t squared. Actually, well, t squared minus four has to be zero mod t squared. And let's, uh, so I'm grouping the gammas by the, by the t's. Okay, so far so good. Now, how many matrices can have the same T? So let's look at how many gammas, in, even in SL2, uh, in a ball of size T. Gammas in SL2, Z, in a ball of size N, uh, can have a, a fixed trace. Well, if I fix the trace, that means I fix A plus D equals T. Okay, so if I fix A first, I have N choices for A, then D is determined, because D is, D is uh, whatever uh, T minus A is determined, determined. And then BC, so I have AD minus BC equals one. So if A is determined and D is determined, then BC is equal to one uh, uh, AD minus one, whatever it is. It's a divisor, it's a divisor set. B is a divisor of AD minus one. So that's the uh, end of the epsilon. Yep. Okay, so let's go all the way back here. So forget about this, all right, I'll put out, pull out an end of the epsilon. The number of things here is N, crudely, very crudely, yep. N. Then I have a sum over primes up to n to the one half, but at most n to the beta, and a sum over t up to n. So how many t's are there? How many t's are there where t has to lie in a certain residue class mod p squared? t is restricted mod p squared. Less than mod t. Sorry? Yeah, you're definitely going to end up with less than mod t. Yeah, so the, so the t, the t's are in some residue classes mod p squared. Mm. Well, that means that I have to take one out of every p squared of them. So there's an n over p squared. Yeah. Does that make sense? Can you repeat that? That's I'm just saying uh, I have I'm running over numbers up to n yes. that are in, in a particular residue class mod p squared. So the mesh of how many there are is there's there's one every uh, or there, one or two there's a finite number every p squared. Yeah, is it the plus one? Yes, thank you. I was waiting for someone yeah, to tell yeah, me plus yeah. one. <laughs> okay, do not lose the plus one. Now p is at most root n. So n over p squared is already at least one. So we don't need the plus one. Okay, this was important. If we didn't uh, have this condition, then we would have the plus one and then we'd be dead. Right, that's, that's what I'm about to say. In the right case, the left case, then you don't have this n to one half flexibility. Right. Okay, so now we just have to sum one over p squared. Let's, let's uh, expand that to all integers. 
So, so far I have n to the two. Too many n's, I guess I, I lost track of where one of the n's came from. So the n epsilon n on the outside, you're saying that comes from the inner sum? This inner sum has multiplicity at most n to the one plus epsilon. And then you're estimating. So that's coming here. And then where did the n come from? The n over p squared? Where that's this. You get over p squared, why do we have an n? Because there's because t goes up to n. Oh, because you're considering n many. Times. All possible okay. traces of size n, but only one out of every or two out of every p squared okay. of them uh, contribute. Okay, and so this sum. Well, now I can extend the sum out to infinity because one over n squared converges. Uh, so compare this to the integral from n to the beta uh, to infinity of one over x squared. 1 over x squared dx from n to the beta to infinity. At infinity, there's no problem. The tail converges, but it converges like, so this is 2 plus epsilon minus beta. There's a 1 over n to the beta. OK. All right. So. That's how many things we have to subtract off. But the size of S, so let's go back. We want the size of S. Um, let me put a star here. So star is this. So what we've shown is that star is at least the size of S. The size of S is right here, which is n to the 2 delta Forget about these logs for a second. Let's be crude. N to the two delta A minus big O of this, N to the two minus beta. In the major dimension to the bigger. Yep, exactly. So, so if two delta A is greater than two minus beta, we win. And what, what flexibility do we have on beta? Therein lies the rub. <laughs> right? We know we can make delta. We know we know we can make delta A go to one by increasing A. In other words, allowing the geodesics to go higher and higher, but still at a fixed height. And that means beta smaller. That's the question. That's the question. What happens to beta? And it looks like, where did beta come from? Beta came from the sieve black box, which came from alpha. Beta is a direct, beta comes directly from alpha. Where does alpha come from? Alpha comes directly, uh, where was our alpha? There's our alpha, from theta. Theta comes directly from expansion. How good is the expansion? Well, the expansion is great for a fixed group. But once you start changing with group you have, this theta depends on the group. The quality of the spectral gap, now it shouldn't, uh, we think. I mean, there are conjectures about, there are various, uh, we, we believe that it, that it shouldn't, but all the, the, the proofs we currently have there's, there's a one, you, you always fix the group, then there exists some, some theta depending on the group. And we're now we're varying A, we're varying the group if we want to get the dimension up high enough to beat out beta, but beta might be dropping faster. So beta is, so that's the subtle thing. So, but beta is a function of alpha, the, the exponent distribution. Alpha is a function of theta, the uh, expansion constant and theta is a function of the group that you started with. So everything depends on A. So beta is really beta of A. And I don't know that the rate at which delta increases is better than the rate at which beta decreases, potentially decreases. So, so when this happens, what I would probably do is go look at the groups of each every step, all yes. the black boxes, 
and make sure they keep track of the, the best thing that can be kept track of without like, this new idea and hope for the best. Yes. What do you just try to find a new idea? What the type of stuff like that? So one could go into those black boxes and yeah, their proofs, be very careful, yeah. be very careful yeah. and hope that at the end of those hundreds and hundreds of pages of extremely technical calculation, yeah. you get something that we know the rate at which delta, delta, uh, um, I think I mentioned some time ago, what we know sort of the leading order of how delta approaches one as A changes. Ah, that we know. So that we do know. But the beta, if you actually went and worked things out, this might be, you know, uh, e to the minus a squared or something, for all we know. It's already been worked out. No, or, no. Nobody First, went through the hundreds of pages. No one has gone through the hundreds of pages to get uh, something that's uniform so to get to understand the dependence in a. And if they did, the danger is that the the amount that beta would have to shrink. Of the known proofs, that's not that's probably not the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of the known proofs, it probably has to. It probably shrinks a lot worse than than the rate at which delta climbs towards one. And knowing that failure, does that tell us anything? Or it tells us we don't have a paper. <laughs> we need like, to do something else to, to yeah. have a paper. Because these methods don't like, shed light on anything. If they fail. If they yeah, if you can't, I mean, you, you're trying to produce uh, these square free values, and you can almost do it. It looks easy. It's a, it's, as far as the sieving is concerned, it's a trivial sieve, the square free sieve on a linear form. It's trace squared minus four, but trace squared minus four is really trace plus two times trace minus two. So it's really, uh, you know, Splits. It's, it's, it's a split sieve. It's sieve dimension is two, but it's not really quadratic. Wait, and then how, how, how is it varying explicitly? Um, a, so a, a is the height. We control A. We say there exists some height so that there are infinitely many fundamental low line closed geodesics below this height. And then A is, uh, right. And so, so let me tell you what we do. What is the group? What, what was gamma A's definition like that? Gamma A is the, is our favorite, uh, semi group. It's all these matrices, A110, where A is bounded by capital A. Oh, but this A doesn't necessarily exactly correspond with the height? With the height, it's almost exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah I think up to the constants. Order getting, they're around yeah. the same order? Yeah. Okay. okay, so let me, I don't want to spend three uh, lectures on this. <laughs> <laughs> like we like we did with Zaremba, especially because we have three lectures left. So and I, has been solved. So let me show you how. Was it new That's right. So uh, new ideas. So th there's a whole we, we had a, a series of projects. We call this uh, the Beyond Expansion Program. So beyond, <laughs> beyond yeah, we need yes. we need there were a whole bunch of applications where we needed exponents of distribution that were better than those that come from expansion alone. This is the beyond expansion program. This is a common technique for like the circle method, you know, oh, you use this technique and you want to. It turned out that there were a whole bunch of problems that where this kind of technique could be could be useful. Mm -hmm. So beyond expansion program, again, this is, I keep saying it, but I know that I wrote it it's, uh, with Bergen, is to get, to get exponents of distribution, exponents alpha uh, that are better than those beyond those uh, beyond those coming from expansion. Can I ask you a quick question? Please. So the expansion is sort of the analog of something like a siegel voltage theorem or something? That's right. That's right. So, or a Selberg one quarter. OK. Is it, is, uh, so some bound towards Ramanujan? Yep. So could you? suffice with something like an analog of Bombieri Vinogradov? That's exactly what this, uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly okay. right. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're okay. not going to get, uh, we're not going to get better estimates individually. This is an individual estimate. Uh -huh. We do not know how to, how to give improved values of theta for individual values. Right. But we don't need individual values. We only need them on average. Hmm. 
And when you have an extra average, you have an extra chance to do something. What did you call this before? It was a no, it was a moment instead of like a refinement. Uh, it's like a clusterman refinement. Yes, these ideas are all uh, going by different names, uh, but but it's getting it's a similar idea of getting to extra cancellation. Okay, so let me try in the next fifteen minutes to give you some hints as to how you handle this. And alpha was controlling the power, the kind of power savings we were doing. That's right. Alpha is how large a Q, how large a Q you can take and still have all of the errors add up to less than the main term. So you want to be less than the main term, less than the total number of points. How large can you take that theta? Oh, it's just a control how big theta can be. Right. OK. So idea one, idea one is to replace this. Um, you see, what's hard about this is that we're doing non-abelian harmonic analysis in order to, to, to do this. So this, this goes through, as I said, expansion. Uh, in the group case, it goes through um, automorphic forms on infinite volume groups. In the semi-group case, it goes through um, these thermodynamic formalism and real transfer operators. Uh, this is all harmonic analysis on non-abelian groups, which is always harder. And so what we want is to replace, uh, replace, replace non-abelian harmonic analysis with abelian harmonic. So just why why would this be? I guess maybe we'll see with this idea. Why would it? What becomes a lot simpler in the abelian case? What the extra tools? You yes, apply? there are extra tools, and the tools that exist are better. Give better bounds. Give better bounds. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to uh, the sieving problem. The indicator function, the trace squared minus four, is zero mod q. Here's the better way to handle this. Okay, so we're fixing Q. So let's uh, make this a sum over, uh, first of all, the T's mod Q with T squared minus four being zero mod Q. So that's, uh, again, a divisor sum, right? Let's say Q is a prime. So this is, uh, there's two values. Um, and then a sum over uh, gamma and gamma in a ball with the indicator function that the trace of gamma is T mod Q. Now the abelian harmonic analysis would be to break this into progressions in gamma A. The, the non-abelian harmonic analysis would be to break this in progressions mod gamma, mod SL2 Q. Instead, we're gonna capture this condition with abelian harmonics. In other words, we'll sum one over Q, a sum over R mod Q, e to the two pi i q r times this difference, trace gamma minus t. Now we want to use Fourier analysis. Now we want to use Fourier analysis and get exponential sums and cancellation in these exponential sums. Mm -hmm. Now here's the key idea, or a key idea, is to write this again as uh, whatever this is, trace squared minus four is zero mod q, and a sum over gamma and gamma A in a ball. And um, I want to, uh, I want to, I want R and Q to be co-prime. Okay, so I sum one over Q and then all of the possible divisors, let's call it uh, frac Q, a divisor of Q, and then R mod frac Q co-prime to frac Q, E frac Q of R, trace gamma minus gamma. I haven't done anything. I've just uh, grouped these by what the lowest uh, terms are, R over Q. Instead of getting all the Qth roots, I want to sum over the primitive Qth roots over all divisors of Q. I always feel that this report sounds better than the sum by, because I guess they were wrong. But it's kind of better than the sum there, there will be a lot of applications where we really need to know, like in, we saw all these uh, examples where we really need to know that certain things were co-prime so that we get more cancellation out of them. It's hard to get cancellation if you don't know what the right denominator is. So that's why I really want R to be co-prime to Q. And so here is where we will decompose into a main term, like a major arc and a minor arc. There's gonna be a main term and an error term, but it will not simply come from, the way we got the main term and error term last time was uh, this was the main term, and this was the error term. 
So now what we're going to do is something similar, but we're going to break this sum according to whether this cube is large or small. And then why would you call this the circle method? Well, it's not the circle method only in, you see that the technology is completely different, sieving versus the circle method, but the technical input is very similar. Extra cancellation over averages, decomposing sums according to whether a parameter is large or small, and so on. Right. Um, large, large denominator or small denominator, exactly. I guess before, okay, I see what you're saying. You're saying you're, you're going to tackle this crack Q, whereas normally you could have said, like, oh, which angles are the ones that are going to cause exactly. Like, issues? Exactly. But yeah, so, that's sort of why this is not a circle. It's analysis. not a circle method, it's a sieve, but the uh, numerology, the analysis, the analysis is, is <laughs> similar, similar, similar flavor. There's parallels. That's why it's a method and not a theory. <laughs> yeah, you have to have all these techniques under your belt. And then, um, okay, so so we'll write this as a main term plus an error term. This, this, this is our error term, EQN. And EQN is the sum, is exactly this whole sum, except just the terms where uh, Q is large. So there we're expecting cancellation from these exponential sums to be enough. The main term analysis, again, I will skip. It does use the non-abelian harmonic analysis, but only on a much smaller modulus where it doesn't interfere with the length of the sum that it will eventually come in. So you have to do something there, but let me, in the interest of time, just tell you now we need... How long is the paper? The paper is not that long. It's only 40 pages, something like that. Um, yeah. It's not as hard as the other one, but it's still has a lot of uh, ideas. Um, so I'm going to put in, so this is what we need to now estimate. Okay. Um, how many ideas can I show you about this? So, uh, so when we have this sum, we'll open it up. There's a, I'll, I'll catch the absolute value with some zeta. This is what you mean, you're going to apply the sieve. To apply the sieve. Yeah, okay. And the previous thing we had on the expansion was not with the sum. It's just no, it was with the sum. We need this with uh, Q being n to the alpha, where this alpha is independent of theta. We need to get an absolute level of distribution or exponent of distribution. I just think that the expansion gave us the, an error term for every Q. That's right. But we don't want to use expansion because that error yeah. term comes with an end to the theta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't need something that strong. We need right. something we, we want to, yeah, so we want to get this to be smaller than the total number of points. We want to get cancellation. And by the way, the trivial bound, so how much do we need to save here? The trivial bound uh, on this is just the size of gamma A in a ball. So we need to save Q. Let's keep track of that. Need to save Q. Q to the, yeah, Q to the one plus a little bit. So that we get our little O, not just. Okay. I haven't, I haven't quite understood this trick that you always uh, you're capturing the absolute value. Yes. Zeta Q, you're saying is uh, minus one. For every Q, there's an absolute value uh, zeta Q, mm -hmm. so that the absolute value is just the the expression itself times some number. So I'll catch that number, whatever that is, so that I can open up this sum. So now I'm going to stick in the sum. So I have a sum over T. Uh, mod Q that are uh, with T squared is zero mod Q. I have a sum on gamma. Oh, you're saying that zeta Q was going to reverse whatever you had to do to, to, to put it absolute value. value. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Uh, one over Q, a sum over the large, the large divisors, and some something that I'm hoping will have cancellation E Q. <laughs> Uh, trace gamma minus T. Okay. Now I'll reverse orders on this sum. Because it's this frac Q. That's that's supposed to be a frac Q, and it's a frac Q. Okay. So I'll reverse orders on this frac Q. The frac Q is also at most Q because it divides Q, which is at most Q. So I'll reverse orders. I have a frac Q, which is at least Q0. And that's where we're supposed to get our savings. 
and then a sum over gamma in gamma in a ball. Um, this one over, okay, I'll leave the one over Q uh, to the end. A sum over R mod frac Q co prime, E frac Q of R trace gamma, the T is going to come all the way outside. So then I have a sum over Q at most Q, zeta of Q, a sum over T mod Q, T squared minus four is zero mod Q, uh, one over Q, and a E to the E frac Q R minus T. So minus RT. How exactly did you change So I pulled this sum outside. Okay. This sum depends on both of you, right? This, uh, I think that the small Q should be somehow in front because the frac Q divides the small Q. Yes, thank you. So Q is zero mod frac Q. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to reverse the order and change this condition into this condition. That's exactly what I want to do. But then, then track, um, if you see the lower bound, what's the track? Exactly. Exactly. Now I have these things being co prime. Okay. This will be very easy to, uh, to estimate. I'm going to put absolute values here. And I'm going to take Cauchy Schwartz in the gamma variable. Cauchy Schwartz again. Okay. So if I take Cauchy Schwartz in the gamma variable, so now CS in gamma, Cauchy Schwartz in the gamma variable tells us that this sum uh, squared, so the sum of EQ and Q up to Q squared is bounded by what? So the number of elements I have here is n to the two delta, which is fine. And then a sum over uh, gamma in gamma a in a ball. And now the norm squared of frac q and frac q prime, a sum over r mod frac q, a sum of co prime r prime mod frac q prime co prime. What is Lewis saying? Yes, for so, yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Cushy Schwartz for some people is an inequality. For others, it's a living. Yeah. For me, it's a, it's definitely a living. Um, e Q R trace of gamma times this crap. This crap I'll call uh, zeta one of Q. Zeta one of frac Q. All of this absolute value squared. So now you have to say Q squared. But now I have to save, need to save, save Q squared. Okay. Um, right. Well. Do you really guarantee to get some sort of payoff here? Nope. It's just happening to work? Like, you, yeah. I mean, that's why it's a paper. Yeah, so it's sure it's always the things that work, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. The things that didn't work, I'm not showing you. Yeah, there's a survivor bias. <laughs> So there's a lot of things where you just do Cauchy Schwartz and get a much worse bound than a yes. trivial one. Yes. So what I'm going to do here is replace gamma in this semigroup that I have no control over and where the harmonic analysis is difficult by something where I still have difficult harmonic analysis, but it's slightly better. So I'll increase. Since anyway, I have to make delta close to one, I will increase from gamma A up to SL2Z. Now you don't have a varying group? Um, I will still have a varying group because in the end, I'll need to pass the congruent subgroups of SL2Z. But there I have the Selberg one quarter conjecture or the bounds towards Ramanujan, which are, which are an exponent that's independent of A. I've removed the dependence on A in the expansion. Removed A dependence. I mean, is this dependent on conjecture, or is this like yeah. definitely? Uh, we can definitely do it. It's it's not dependent on conjecture, but the Selberg one quarter uh, conjecture is a conjecture, but there are bounds towards it that are not. And then you use those. You use those ah, yeah. that are the, those unconditional. So we remove the a dependence in the non-abelian harmonic analysis. You did add a lot of terms, right? I added a lot of terms. 
Yes, and, and by the way, uh, what's the size of the diagonal? So we certainly will not get any cancellation if R is equal to R prime and Q is equal to Q prime. Okay, so the diagonal, diagonal is Q is equal to Q prime and R is equal to R prime. No cancellation there, no hope of cancellation. And so the most we could possibly save, most we could save, we could save is Q squared. But we need to save Q squared plus a little bit. So this seems doomed. Wait, why are, why were we looking at the diagonal? Because there's nothing to do with the diagonal. Yeah, on, on the diagonal, when I have this norm squared, uh, sorry, uh, what am I doing? Norm squared. I've already taken the square. Yeah. I've already taken the square. There's no absolute values here. There's this, there, there's this, and there's the corresponding, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm rushing and, and being EQ prime minus R prime trace gamma. Right, that, that goes in there, and then there's another zeta one. So there's no hope of getting cancellation in the sum if if these two things are, are coincide, they just cancel, and you have one. So we can't possibly save more than Q squared. The zeta ones, uh, it's it's trivial to estimate them away. There's a I'm I'm trying to go fast. They they can't save us no. <laughs> Their triviality uh, hurts us. I mean, I know it's, it's one of the ones, yes. But yeah. Uh, yeah. They're not what's going to save us. What's going to save us is any guesses? What haven't we made use of that we made crucial use of in Zaremba? In Zaremba, you went into like the AD minus BC. We use Poisson. It, the the crucial first step was to make a bilinear structure. Oh. We have not yet created so new idea, whatever number idea this is, new idea, idea, creates a bilinear structure. You're gonna redefine what we're estimating. We're gonna redefine what we're studying. Instead of studying um, uh, this, instead of the, the main uh, uh, change, exactly, change to gamma 1 in a ball of size uh, x, gamma 2 in a ball of size y, and the indicator function of the trace of gamma 1 times gamma 2 squared minus 4 being 0 mod q. Why did this work for us last time? Like, why was this better than just doing one of them? Because uh, doing one of them, we had nothing to even start with. Doing more than one, we, we could balance. Uh, one time we balanced root n by root n. Right. Another time we balanced quarter n by n to the three quarters. But, I mean, like, how is this related to the original problem? Like, why? Oh, is this is still because it's still the product of matrices that are in the same. The product of matrices in the semigroup is still in the semigroup. And if we can make the product trait of the traces square free, then that's uh, a that's good enough. Same, similar. Same as time. same as yep. I might be overcounting. That's right. That's right. Now we we might be overcounting, but if we produce a number that's growing to infinity, so in fact, there's a way to make it not double count. But let me not not go into that. <laughs> Uh, there's a way to control the length of the words so that they uh, glue together uniquely. It's and anything, yes. Okay. Again, let me uh, <laughs> let me point you. Since I'm already way over, let me point you to the paper for, for how you do that. But then, when you go to do your Cauchy Schwarz, you have an extra sum over gamma two and gamma two prime, and so there you can do all kinds of stuff. And now you can save a little bit more, as if this is a, a, a tiny size. Now you can save a little bit more and, and you've removed the A dependence on the harmonic analysis and then the previous argument goes through Which with came, a lot of work. So your, first, your result with the, uh, the first result you presented chronologically came first compared to this. You were looking at this at Bourdain after having done the other work with circle this, method? This paper was after the, the Zaremba paper, that's right. Uh, so those ideas were already like in, in your head. We, yeah, you start, you know, uh, 
what is it uh, when all you have is a hammer every problem starts looking like nails yeah so uh, we saw this and we and we said why, why can't you just I do it i win your forms extra cancellation kashi schwartz yes uh, the technical execution is completely different if you read that paper if you read this paper uh, the technical execution is using rather different ideas the big ideas but the initial ideas for where to go when you're stuck are very similar